Good morning. Please pay attention to this bill and more uh, focus on the signature. It's a woman's signature, the first woman's signature since 1998. To Christine Lagarde being the only woman in a man's world and reaching the um, high-level positions is not an exception. That's the story of her life. The president of the European um, Central Bank uh, is not scared of uh, challenges because uh, right now the Eurozone is under uh, difficulties. She is in charge of over 340 mil, uh, million people and she will be with us today. Uh, it's Thursday, we are on the 2nd of March and there are more pieces of news today. So this is a summary of the Mediador case, which is a corruption case going on in Spain at the moment. I have nothing to hide. Whoever knows me uh, knows how sincere and honest I am. I consider myself a victim. Do you feel abandoned by your party? Not by my roots colleagues, but by the party, uh, the, he um, the high managers of the party? Yes. So the Socialist Party is trying to stop the Popular Party scandal. Uh, we are three months away from the elections and this case uh, is bringing up a lot of debate. It is more necessary than ever that we set up a research investigation that uh, decides which political responsibilities there are. So he has been um, expelled from the party. Pachi Lopez was here with us yesterday and he provided uh, more data about those people who went for a dinner in Ramses, a restaurant in Madrid. Do you know for a fact that they just went for dinner? Yes, in some cases, yes. Okay, so in other cases, maybe not. No, no, that's not what I said. Please don't misinterpret me. I said that in some cases they didn't because that is the cases that we know for a fact that we spoke to them and we know that they went to dinner. Dinner, full stop. Ferrovial is um, going to have its base in the Netherlands. We will analyze what reasons there are for this flea. Well, I, I totally reject this incorrect decision. I really don't share this decision. Well, what the uh, vice president should do is wonder if, did I do anything for them to stay? We will provide some uh, data about unemployment. We have nearly 3 million unemployed people and there are 200,000 positions that are still uncovered. And why is that? later. So now, uh, please, um, we are going to be listening to Madame Lagarde. She's already sitting with us on stage. Christine Lagarde, Madame President, welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. From the institution that you chair, the European Central Bank, uh, you have the challenge to try and bring down the inflation in the Eurozone. For 11 years, you didn't raise up the money, but in only half a year, rates have had the greatest surge in history. Let's look at the evolution. Yes, a month ago, the European Central Bank approved a new rate hike of 50 basis points. That means that the money is at 3% in the Eurozone. And this is the fifth consecutive hike. It's the fastest cycle in history. We can see the evolution here. So we had a valley since 2016. Rates had been at 
not percent, but in July 2022, the curve started going up at an unprecedented rate. And that is when the European Central Bank started um, elevating the value of the money in order to stop inflation. But our question is, is this the end? Because the ECB is revising prices in March again. Yes, and as an unprecedented gesture, you anticipated that in the next March um, meeting, we will have a new hike of 0.5%. Um, is this still the case? Has nothing changed? Um, and it was surprising that you gave a heads up because that's not um, the norm, is it? Well, first of all, I think that there is every reason to believe that we will have another 50%, 50 basis points hike um, at our next meeting in March. And that is so because inflation is just way too high. And we need to take all the necessary measures in order to bring inflation down. This is necessary because the mission of the ECB is to maintain price stability. Inflation is way too high. We need to look at what tools we have to bring it down. And interest rates, uh, particularly for the short term, uh, is the most efficient tool that we can use. So I cannot say yes for sure, because it's a decision that is made by the governing council, but we have anticipated that this is very likely to be the case. And I don't have any reason to believe that it will not be the case, but we look at data, we look at numbers. Uh, we have had a few numbers recently. We are working on our projections. Staff of the ECB will give us uh, their projections going forward. And we will to take all that into account. But for the March decision, I don't have much doubt. Let's put it that way. So can we think that there will be uh, further hikes uh, for the rest of the year? Because we have just um, learned about the data for February in Spain and France, mm. and they are not very good. We see that there's a rebound in inflation. So should we think that there would be further hikes uh, later in the year? We said that we would be data dependent, and I think that that's the most important um, uh, set of element uh, that will determine our decision. So we look at most recent numbers, of course, and yes, you're right, they've been on the upside in various countries. And um, we look at our projections, uh, we look at the path ahead to see how much ground we have to cover, and uh, then we make a decision. So we shall see. Um, at this point in time, it's possible that we will continue on that path by which amount each and every uh, meeting, it's impossible to say at this point in time. There is a lot of guess estimates and some people say, oh, it will be so much or it will be so much. The real honest answer is that we will be determined by data and we will decide when we, when we see the data. What is, on the other hand, very certain is that we will do whatever is needed in order to bring inflation back to 2%, because this is what our mission is, and this is what the people of Europe expect from us, bring inflation down to target, which is 2%. I understand this is not an easy decision. Sometimes we hear that there is a, a fight between doves and, and falcons, those who are more in favor of mitigating these rate hikes and others who are in favor of applying uh, more drastic measures. Aren't we risking um, slowing down the economy in the whole uh, euro area because uh, businesses and individuals will have trouble uh, paying this such elevated risk you know, hikes? It is obvious that if you increase interest rates, it is going to make financing costs for the banks higher. They will themselves charge higher interest rates uh, to their borrowers, and that will have a dampening effect on demand. But that's the tool that we have, and that's the one that is going to be demonstrating that it brings inflation and prices down. The impact is on demand, for sure. It would, by the way, uh, be also very helpful uh, that any supply bottlenecks, uh, any uh, constraints on supply be removed as much as possible so that there is a good adjustment between supply and demand.
So what would be the cap? Is there a maximum that you are looking at? Because if we uh, look at what the Federal Reserve are doing, they talk about even 5.5. Uh, they are at 4% now. But is this the horizon that we're looking at? I think it would be a mistake to compare Europe and the United States. The origin of inflation is different in the United States from what it is in Europe. For us, it was a combination of very prompt recovery after the terrible COVID uh, that we suffered, and then it was the Ukraine in invasion by Russia, this terrible uh, uh, and unjustifiable event that took place a year ago. So these two factors have been fueling inflation through the channel of energy prices and commodity prices. So originally you have a combination of very fast recovery, rather compressed supply. So the demand was strong, but the supply was limited. And then you had energy prices, which were nicely engineered by Putin, in my humble view, and fueled by the war in Ukraine. So that's the European story. In the United States, it's a, it's a different one. It's largely uh, fueled by a very, very strong stimulus package that was put together, fiscal measures that were massive. From Trump to Biden, there was a lot of stimulus, and that obviously heated the economy. There was very high demand addressed at a time when China was in the process of recovering and other countries constrained uh, their supply. So that's where it is. Different story, different tools, different levels. So I don't think that we can compare the two as if they were exactly the same. What I know is that we need to go higher. We need to be in restrictive territory and we need to stay there for long enough so that we are confident that inflation returns sustainably to 2%. So it has to be higher and it has to be sustained for a period of time. Exactly where, I cannot tell you. There are multiple views. Again, we will be data dependent. We will look at the impact that our measures are having. And, um, and we, will, we will stay there so that you know, we make sure it remains on target. It's not just a little blip and then back up again. No, we don't want that. So for the time being, Madame Lagarde, we have seen that uh, those um, hikes impact the Euribor and the prices, but not on inflation because it hasn't gone down. But we're going to go around Spain so that uh, citizens can ask questions themselves. Uh, in Galicia, Julia and Hector are 30 years old. They have just had a child and they want to buy uh, their home, but they cannot afford to. We would love to buy a house. Yes, of course. Uh, can we afford it? Well, unfortunately, no. We would like to know when can we do it? When will the um, interest rates go down so that we can have access to uh, a house of our own? We can see that these rate hikes has a direct impact on the Euribor, which is the mortgage um, reference rate and that's where citizens and families are seeing the highest impact especially if they want to have a, a variable rate uh, mortgage yes many more people are suffering uh, financial uh, stress in february uh, euribor was at 3.53 percent which is the highest since november 2018 and we have been seeing 14 months of uh, increase in a row in February 2022, Euribor was in negative points, minus 33. And in just over one year, uh, there's an increase of nearly four points. So Spanish uh, people who have a variable mortgage will see the impact. For a 150,000 euro mortgage uh, in 25 years, uh, the difference is of 300 euros a month, but let's say that we have a higher mortgage, 300,000. Well, uh, the increase is of 600 per month. It's over 7,000 euros per year more. Yes, yeah, so people who have to uh, use six years worth of their salary uh, to buy a home. So what's going to happen with the Euribor, Madame Lagarde? Because some people have said um, that some people believe that it can reach four or five percent uh, in the summer. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the young couple that just had a, a baby. I think that's a wonderful sign of hope and and. Uh, uh, 
you're a mother, I'm a mother, and it, it changes your life. And you look at, okay, where shall we live? What car can we, can we drive? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. What I would like to say is that interest rates will not return to where it was two, three, four, five years ago, when interest rate was actually negative. Okay, Euribor was negative. And um, obviously, as a result of the change of situation that I tried to explain, where inflation went up, we need to use interest rates in order to tame inflation and make sure that it returns to 2%. So our pr the, the projection of our staff at the ECB at the moment tells us that ECB, that inflation will return close to 2% in 25. 2% is a very decent inflation rate. And uh, I'm determined to bring it back to that. At which point, when we are confident that it will stay there, interest rates will begin going down. So interest rates are not high forever. Once we stabilize the situation, once inflation is back to 2%, once prices are stable again in grocery shops, in, in, uh, when you buy things, uh, then interest rates will go down. But you see, what I understand from the Spanish market is that currently there are fewer people who take adjustable rates. People tend to go for fixed rate in order to lock in the rates that they will pay and to have some certainty about the future. Those who took adjustable rates had the benefit for many years of very, very low interest rates. Now, of course, because you take the good with the rough, you had the good because it was low, and now because interest rates have to go up to tame inflation, interest rates are higher. So I know it is tough for some people, and I know that mortgage uh, rates for some are, are difficult. I also know that some Spanish banks in particular are open to renegotiation of the terms of the mortgages. And I think that people who are uh, indebted, who have a mortgage, should explore with the banks uh, whether there are options uh, in order to avoid falling into uh, you know, a, a difficult point where the loan is not performing anymore, the house is at risk of being uh, attached and foreclosed, which, which is terrible. It's true that the change of the mortgage uh, changes have been uh, so much higher than um, in last year. And then we have a good practice code uh, promoted by the government that ma most banks have um, adhered to it, but there are many uh, obstacles to it, and not so many people can, can do it. I would like to um, ask you about what Podemos, the partner in government, because they accuse you to do uh, monetary terrorism, and they're asking for caps in mortgages. What do you have to say about that? Well, I'm not a terrorist, that's for sure. And I'm guided by public interest and by the mission that was given to the ECB under the Treaty of Europe. And our mission is to return price to target and to maintain price stability. We are, we are the custodian of the euro. Cap on mortgages, it's not something that the central bank can decide. This is not our mission. This is not our, our it, it's, it's impossible to do that. It would be, you know, something that uh, regulators can decide at the national level and uh, or it's something that can be negotiated with banks but it's not for the European Central Bank to, to, to do that. Can you uh, confirm that uh, delaying payments have skyrocketed or that banks are not giving so many mortgages uh, due to risk of uh, default? There has been a reduction in the volume of loans that have been asked by families, and there has been a reduction of loans that have been asked by companies. So I think the, the, the price of money having increased, people think, okay, I'm not borrowing now. I, I try to use my savings or I try to uh, organize myself differently. Uh, but this is intended. You know, we, we, we need to 
dampen demand. We need to weigh on uh, you know, the cost uh, of financing uh, so that we have reduced demand on the part of both families and corporates. So in that way, you would say that our monetary policy is actually transmitting to, uh, to the economy via the banks. This is what happens in, Euro in Europe. We are predominantly financing the economy through banks. So we hiked interest rates. Money is more expensive for banks. They make it more expensive to families and corporates when they lend to families and corporates. But they should also not forget to remunerate deposits. Yes, we will talk about that because yeah. that uh, is not being fulfilled. Only a few banks are remunerating a bit more uh, the assets and, um, in the deposits. But um, we're seeing that the ECB took uh, a long time in raising uh, interest rates. They were kept at zero for many years. So the feeling is that when you decided to react and to bring them up, the progression has been uh, incredible in just uh, over six months. Uh, do you regret taking so long to react? You know, inflation started being really noticeable in July of 21. And at that time, most economists said, transitory, temporary, we will see through this because it comes from the supply. It's a supply shock. It's a tax from the outside, if you will, and it will go away. It will be absorbed and it will, uh, it will be transitory. It was not transitory. And um, it lasted um, much longer. It transmitted to the economy. And we decided at the end of 21, that is in, uh, um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting my, my numbers mixed up. It's, uh, it's at the end of 22. It's at the end of 21, yeah, that we, that we started um, normalizing our monetary policy. So what we did is, in December 21, we announced that we were going to reduce and then stop the purchase of assets, that we were going to reduce and stop the emergency program that we had put in place in order to fight COVID and bring enough liquidity to the economy and support the economy. And it's in uh, June 22 that we then decided, having stopped purchases, that we decided to hike interest rates. And we did so as of July and consistently and at a very high pace, you're right, uh, and unheard of before in Europe. Could we have started three to six months earlier? Possibly. Would it have made a huge difference I don't think so. So it would have been better to start earlier. Um, do I have regrets? I'm looking at what comes next. I'm looking at the future. I'm looking at how we can improve the situation and bring inflation back to target. That's what I'm most focused on now. In spite of all these rate hikes over the past six months, uh, we can see that inflation is, uh, is wild. We were told that prices would moderate in 2023, but that's not the case. Today, we're going to find out the latest available uh, piece of data, but in January, the um, CPI was at 8.6%. That means that prices uh, were moderated. We can see it on the curve because uh, inflation goes down not uh, 0.6% back to uh, December levels. And we are seeing three months in a row where uh, inflation prices go down. It's the lowest level in the Eurozone since July 2022. If we compare it um, with the average of the Eurozone, Spain holds a good position. The harmonized index is at 5.9% together with Luxembourg at 5.8%. Luxembourg is the Eurozone country with the lowest rate. But what is the greatest concern, the underlying inflation? There's no truce. There's a new record at 5.3%. That is uh, an all-time high. Yes, so let's go back to the street in Sevilla. She's a housewife. She has four children. She's 67 years old, and she says that she has to 
be really creative with a shopping basket. I used to like coming to the market, but now is a nightmare. Until when are we going to see prices going up? Are we ever going back to prices before the crisis? So, Madame Lagarde, uh, for how much longer will prices still go up? When will we uh, peak? What's your forecast? First of all, um, I would observe that inflation has lowered and gone down in the last three months. It's gone up a little bit in February, by the way, okay? So it's not stable declining. It's, it's, it's a directional decline, but it, it is not steady. In particular, the price of food is increasing at the moment. What we will see in March is numbers that will go down much more so than we have simply because of base effects. I told you earlier on that the price of energy hiked significantly as a result of the Ukraine uh, invasion by Russia. And that was 24th of February last year. So we will have base effects uh, for the March numbers. And we are confident that it will then continue to go down. But it is still just way too high. Uh, as mentioned, 8.6 uh, is way too high for the Eurozone and uh, the ECB has to continue to take action in order to reduce inflation. You know, I, when I come back in one year's time, I don't want this, uh, this lady to still be angry. And I understand why she's angry. I understand that prices are up. And when I do my own shopping, I can see that myself. So my hope is that we, we can bring it down uh, as rapidly as we can. But it's going to take a while because it has, you know, sort of invaded uh, the whole economy. It's a bit like a poison inflation. It penetrates through a part of your body and then it gently, quietly, or not so quietly at all, uh, invades the whole body. We need to tame that. We need to stop it. Okay, so I, I'll keep uh, the two uh, reflections that from One March <laughs> uh, prices will start go down and also that you will yeah. be back next year with us uh, in order to confirm that. But I'm sure that you're worried about the underlying, as you said, yeah. it's like a poison, an invisible poison that it's attacking uh, economy. That's 7.7 7, um, of the underlying inflation in Spain is the um, highest figure since there are records. Yeah, and just, just for your, uh, your watchers to understand, uh, what we call the, the, the core inflation is a whole basket of prices, excluding energy, excluding uh, unprocessed food. All the rest is in that core inflation. And as I told you, the original inflation that was driven partly by the strong recovery against constrained supply, plus the energy that fueled it, that does sort of trickled and invaded all of the goods and the services. What I'm really concerned about is the service sector, because that is the one that is uh, predominantly, you know, our economies. We, we still have some industry, we, we, we have uh, goods determining portion of the basket, but services are the predominant part and generally services are labor intensive. And that takes us in the direction of wages and how wages and how labour costs are going to evolve uh, in the near future. Yes, we will be talking about wages yeah. as well because they're not uh, matching inflation except for the case of uh, pensions in Spain. But uh, we can't see that uh, the measures adopted by the government are working. Uh, they uh, lowered the VAT in some uh, food. What do you think about this um, discount in VAT? You know, I was Minister of Finance for my country in France for four years. And I know that uh, reducing VAT is one of the easiest, most convenient uh, tool to use in order to reduce prices. But it has two drawbacks. One is it benefits everyone, whether you're rich or poor, whichever car you're driving, whichever house you live in, you're going to have the benefit of reduced VAT. This should not be the intention of governments in Europe at the moment. Okay, it should be targeted. It should be the measures, the fiscal space, the, uh, the, the, the taxpayers' money that is put out uh, for good work for, to the economy should go to the most exposed people, to the most vulnerable people, okay? The second drawback of these VAT measures is that at some point, 
you need to bring them back up. So you, you zero them or you reduce them, but you need to come back to those previous rates because you need to fill in uh, the coffers of, of the state. You need to have the revenue. At the time when you bring it back up, then that has an inflation on prices. And that determines, yet again, um, a hike in, in prices. So this, I understand why it is done, but it's not, it's not the ideal uh, tool, I have to say. I think that Spain does another, um, as another benefit. For those people who earn less than 27,000 euros per year, they get a special stipend of 200. That, that is much more targeted. That is, yes, in our right. view, uh, you know, a better use of benefits at the moment. Yes, but that is a one-off payment and requirements are uh, strict in order to be able to, to get that. I won't ask you about the Podemos uh, option of uh, subsidizing the shopping basket, just like we did with oil, fuel for cars. Mm -hmm. So I will save that question, okay? However, I do uh, have a question for you uh, regarding wages, because when we go out in Madrid, we see Alfredo, he's 57 years, he has um, contributed for uh, many decades, but his salary is not matching the price uh, surge. I only got a 10 euro um, increase in my payroll. I can't make ends meet, so Madame Lagarde, until when are we going to have to live in this situation? So when will wages go up? Because the um, ECB has always uh, requested moderation in wages increase. But in Spain, uh, the minimum wage has uh, risen uh, nearly 8%, but mm -hmm. regular wages have not, only at 2.7%. Yeah, my understanding that it is that in Spain, minimum wages has gone up by 8% and pensions have also gone up. Right. So in, in a way that, that is that is very targeted to those who have minimum income. Uh, and although it fuels demand, it's it's clearly targeted. You know, what we are observing in many uh, countries of the euro area is that unions, um, workers, employees are putting pressure on companies and employers to say, look, inflation is up. Prices are up. The business is still going reasonably well at the company level. There is a good reason to sit at the table and to negotiate uh, how we are going to cope with the situation. And I think that this is a desirable outcome, not to go into you know, a, 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 a dangerous spin of prices up, wages up, prices up, and so on and so forth, that the, economic, the economists uh, call the second round effect. We, we, we should, as much as possible, stay away from that because otherwise we will have to tighten monetary policy even more than, than we should. But catch-up clauses, a reasonable negotiated arrangement in order to increase salaries is something that we observe in many, uh, many European countries and I hope that it can happen in Spain as well. I understand that especially in Spain, uh, the purchasing power has been reduced much more than in our neighboring countries. So from your words, I understand that you uh, are critical with this um, hike in pensions of 8.4 because uh, beyond being an electoral uh, measure, it brings more inflation. Well, the three criteria that we have for benefits and for measures and for special programs are um, Temporary, targeted, and tailored. Temporary because we are dealing with a situation that hopefully is not going to last and that therefore those measures should be relieve, released and, and, and waived when the situation improves. That's number one. Number two, targeted at those people who are most exposed and vulnerable. I think that pensioners with low pensions and minimum wages uh, employees are uh, falling in that category. And tailored because you don't want to disincentivize people from saving energy. So, you know, in that respect, I think that uh, the, uh, the, those measures that you've described that I don't know the details of satisfy some of the criteria. Some of our uh, journalist colleagues uh, have questions for you. So, Paco Marueta, he's the director of La Razón, a newspaper. What's your question, Paco? 
Good morning, Buenos Madame días. Lagarde. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. This is an inflation crisis. It's a crisis that you have to uh, f cold the economy, but there are some interesting questions around. Until when do you think you can keep this situation of not accepting the spending uh, rule uh, to allow uh, overspending? All economic crisis has costs, but the costs right now uh, are being suffered by workers because salaries are not going up. And, uh, well, the government has risen everything. So when you say that um, the crisis has a, a, a horizon, an end, but how can that be if the war in Ukraine has not a finishing um, horizon and it can become another North Korea? You know, I think you, you are right to refer to the uh, war in Ukraine as the big uncertainty and the big cloud over our European economies. And we are much more exposed and much more at risk than, for instance, the US economy. That's another big difference that we have with the US economy. First of all, I think just like you, my hope is that this war will finish, that blood will stop shedding, and that uh, there will be a negotiated settlement and peace negotiated between the parties. But we can live in hope. We don't know whether that will happen or not. In the meantime, I think that what we have seen is an incredible resilience of Europe in general, of enterprises, uh, and, and consumers and employers. All, all of us, we have been employees. All of us, we have been incredibly resilient in the face of this, of this uh, situation. If you look at, at just Europe, you know, first of all, we decided to close ranks and be together. So the next generation EU, the Resilience and Recovery Fund, of which Spain is a great beneficiary. And after the war started, the determination to just stop getting oil and gas from Russia and to turn to alternative suppliers, to negotiate with Norway, with Algeria, with uh, some of the Middle East countries, and to benefit from the unfortunate climate change driven warm winter that we have experienced, except in Madrid in those days. But so all of that has you know, brought the Europeans together and I think has showed resilience at a point that you know, we had not anticipated. We thought that the economy would be down, that we would be negative territory in the fourth quarter of 22. We were not. It was not brilliant, but we were not in recession. And the projection that we have for 23 is that it will come back and activity will return to more positive territory. If you look at enterprises, they've also been incredibly focused and resilient. And I hope that you know, when people look at numbers and look at how um, the fruits of those efforts are allocated, there is a good and sensible uh, allocation between the various factors of production. Madam President, we're going to um, talk a little bit about yourself and about your life. Your uh, French uh, woman, uh, his da her dad was uh, an English teacher and her mom, uh, Greek, Latin, literature. And when your father uh, passes away, you decide to go abroad. I've heard that um, your parents supported you a lot, that they made you become very autonomous and you uh, achieved many things. Let's uh, get to know you a bit better. We could say that her DNA matches leadership because she's been a pioneer in many aspects. To start with her personal life, she is the eldest of four uh, siblings and she was born on the 1st of the 1st, 1956 in Paris. When she was 16, her father died. Her mom's courage uh, to bring them forward uh, had an impact on her life. She was a fan of sports. She uh, joined some French teams. She studied in France and in the United States in this private school for ladies. She got a scholarship and a few years back, she goes back as an alumni. She had a brilliant career as a lawyer in Chicago and she was the first uh, woman uh, chairing this law firm. And from that moment onwards, she would be the first in many other situations. She was the first uh, woman to lead the monetary portfolio. And then she's the first woman uh, running the International Monetary Fund. 
She's a fighter with a very uh, bright humor. She's a, a woman in a world of men. Her um, interest in gender equality has been very seen. Forbes considers her to be one of the most influential person. She was the first woman to uh, run the ECB and the first lady to sign our bills. She's close and shows solidarity. She had to fight a sanitary and an economic viruses, both, and then the war in Ukraine. She has two children, and she says that sports uh, taught her to pick her battles. Inflation is her last fight. In spite of all the challenges, in this 67 years, we can see that she always has a smile on her face. I dare to say that there was tears too. Was it emotional when you saw your family there? Well, it's always moving when you see uh, family members and, uh, you know, my father died when I was 16, so when I see him, yeah. Oh my gosh, all the brothers, yeah. Well, childhood is where you belong ultimately. So, yes, yeah. that's right, childhood. You are, f there's four of you in your family. We can't meet all of them, but one of them is here with us today. What? <laughs> I have to say he has a different uh, surname because Lagarde is the surname of your first husband and the father to her children. Good morning. He's a, an engineer, an entrepreneur. He plays volleyball <laughs> at professional level. And we um, would like him to describe Christine. How are you doing? <laughs> We're great. Look, what was Christine like when she was a, uh, a, a girl? What what she want to become when she grew? Oh dear, what is he going to say? <laughs> um, well, I, I, first of all, I would like to say that we had a very happy time. Christine was intended. Studies. I was probably less serious, and I was more uh, involved in, in practicing sport. And for example, I was practicing my smash, and my in, in, in inside the house we were living, and she was very upset with that. And uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately, um, she was asking our mother uh, to take my volleyball ball and uh, to hide it, and it prevent me, it has prevented me to, to become a, a, a fantastic volleyball player. Oh, but, uh, Rob. Oh, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, any, anyway, we... Apologies, look, I understand that when you were young, or not so young, when you were teenagers, um, you um, were quite rebel. She was an activist. She uh, participated in many in many struggles. Yeah, when when we were rebellious in, uh, at, in school, Christine was about fifteen. I was about thirteen, uh, and at that time we were very involved in, in politics. Uh, that was due to our parents. One one more time, uh, when we were having lunch or dinner, we were listening to the radio. Uh, and we were listening to politics, uh, and we were very much involved. And uh, 
uh, it happened quite a few times that uh, we have participated to demonstrations in the streets uh, and Christine and myself, we were pretty much in front of the demonstrations, <laughs> fighting against La Loi de Bré or La Loi Fontanet. Uh, and I guess at that time that uh, has <coughs> some influence on Christine's career. Um, I understand it did because she studied law and politics um, beyond her career in economy, of course. Would you like to say um, hello to him? I'm sure that you want to say hello or you can uh, speak French if you wish, uh, as, as you prefer. You can talk to your brother. Salut mon grand, tu vas bien? Je vois que tu as un, un, un très sérieux building derrière toi et tu n'as pas, un, as pas un, 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 un trou de golf. Ça m'étonne. Golf, euh, ce sera pour ça. samedi. Euh... Quelle chance. Oui, et il merci, merci, merci beaucoup d'avoir participé. Hein. Merci. Thank you so much, Luke. It's been a pleasure having you too. So I would like to ask you about your family side. Some people think uh, how a woman like Christine uh, has uh, worked life balance. How did she manage to do it? Do you have any tips for us? Uh, Amaya has five years. She's a manager in a chemical sector company. And she has a question. Madame Lagarde, I believe that in Spain, we're taking uh, little measures uh, to strive work life uh, balance. There are not many nursery schools uh, Working hours are long. Uh, the maternity leave is not that great. So what's your opinion about Spain in terms of uh, work-life balance? And what could European institutions do to help us? First of all, I think that it's extremely important and it's a priority that women be given equal opportunity, equal chance, be remunerated equally when they do the same job as men. This is not the case yet. Uh, OECD average difference between men and women's pay for the same job is still north of 10% and sometimes close to 20% in some countries. So I think that's an absolutely critical uh, objective to have. And I would say, you know, I, as head of the IMF, I visited many, many developing countries, many emerging markets. And I think what is fundamental for all of us is to make sure that girls get the same education, have the same equity available so that they can develop into what they want to be. They, can, they may want to be a mother, others might want to be an executive, like the woman that we heard on, on, uh, on the show, but they should be given those opportunities. Not the case, not the case, still today. And I speak from experience. I have lived in a world of men, which is fine, nothing wrong with that, but women must be given the same equity and the same access as, as men. So back to the very practical question that was asked, what needs to be done? In addition to education, obviously public uh, infrastructure and, and uh, available uh, kindergarten places where parents can actually entrust their children for a period of time when they go to work. That, that is critically important. Second, Make sure that the, the, the work that needs to be done at home is properly shared. It is still the case today that women, in addition to the job that they eventually have, do most of the work at home. This is not right. Those tasks have to be shared. It's not for the mother to raise the children and to look after the house and for the man to go and do other things. One of my pride, I have to tell you, you know, my children are now you know, over 35 and, and, and big boys and they have their life and their children. One of my prides is that they know not just how to put a wash on, but they know how to iron their shirt. I've always you know, decided that my sons would not be asking their wives to do that. And it's, a tip, you know, it's very anecdotal, but that's what I mean. Equal education, equity available, access, and available infrastructure for both parents and parents in the house sharing the tasks. And I tell you, if that is available, women thrive. They are amazing. You are amazing. 
Thank you so much, Madam President. We wanted to um, ask this question. Uh, we are only one week away from the 8th of March, the Day of the Woman. And one last question. We're running out of time. But um, Isabel, the director of Expans Expansion, the Buenos newspaper, días. has another question. Uh, congratulations, Madame Lagarde for your um, amazing professional career and also personal, because um, central bankers have a heart, too. I would like to ask you about the Spanish um, economic situation. What do you see in terms of um, employment and growth? We get this question very often as economic journalists, and how um, is that within the European uh, framework? And another question is, if you uh, have discarded the fact that there will be a, a recession in Europe. You know, when, when I look at uh, the numbers of the various member states, I can see that Spain is doing better than others. Whether you look at GDP, whether you look at inflation, it's better unemployment, no, there is more unemployed people in Spain than in other countries. And that has been, I mean, you know Spain much better than I do, but it has been the case historically for long periods of time. And I guess the, you know, coming out of the great financial crisis has taken time. Getting back to the pre-COVID situation is not done yet. So the situation on, in terms of GDP numbers and inflation is better, but Spain has not yet covered the ground to return to the COVID-19 point, or the COVID, the, sorry, pre-COVID-19 point and pre-COVID-19 trajectories. So there is still much work uh, to, to be done. On, on employment and unemployment, I think that we need to really understand who is, who is actually working, because there are quite a few unemployment schemes that are in place, furlough schemes, and who actually uh, produces uh, in the economy is, is something that needs to be really clarified. Are we going to have a recession in 23? Based on our staff projection, no. And th for the overall euro area, I'm not talking about one particular country, but for the overall euro area, we don't see a recession. We may have you know, a technical recession for some countries, uh, you know, two, two quarters in a row that are negative, it certainly might be the case for Sweden. There might be a couple of other countries that are at that risk. But the overall euro area is projected to be in positive territory. We have reasons to believe that Spain will also be in the same situation. So no, no recession on the horizon of our staff projections and an improvement of the situation over the course of 23, yes. Well. Uh, hopefully, let's hope uh, that's the case. We are in Madrid because we have a, a guest with a special interest. She wanted to ask you about the high salaries in some sectors. Uh, we said that uh, salaries in Spain uh, grew up very little uh, by comparison with inflation. Yes, her name is Estela Martinez. She's 24 uh, years old. She works as, as a croupier in an online casino and she earns 1,200 euros and she is renting a flat as many other people. I would like to know, how is it possible that uh, big companies' management uh, earn uh, incredible bonuses when the middle class is getting poorer by the day? Thank you. I'm not sure that a central banker uh, can actually uh, do something about that. It's not the mission of central bankers. And the question that you ask has to do with the way in which value is distributed around societies. That's a societal choice, and it's, uh, it's not something that a central banker can determine. Uh, my hope is that you can make more money, of course, because uh, to cope with inflation, uh, higher wages within reason are, um, would be a good thing. You have also criticized uh, bonuses with some bankers too, and you also claimed that savings was also remunerated. And now I take the opportunity to ask these questions. Why do banks uh, provide so little interest uh, to those who have their money in their banks? I think that's a very good question. And, and one that consumers, clients of the banks should address head-on with their bankers. Uh, you know, we discussed interest rate hikes. Uh, the price of money has gone up. 
the price of borrowing has gone up for both banks and their clients. But if you deposit your savings, and if you are prepared, for instance, to leave it for a period of time, then negotiations should start between the client and the banker in order to have your savings uh, actually remunerated. And this is happening in quite a few countries. I know that this is an issue in Spain. Mm -hmm. And I very much hope that consumers will actually have those discussions. Uh, you know, when, when I was a, a student, I was, I was a very much um, supporting the movement of consumers, consumers associations. Uh, I think that the, 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 the relationship have, sh relationships have to be discussed in a concerted way. In the current situation, obviously, banks, clients have to take up this discussion with bankers. And bankers have to be sensible about it if they want to keep their clients. I think the alternative is change bank. And there are quite a few countries where the switching from one bank to the other has been facilitated. This has certainly been the case in my country, and I did that when I was finance minister. Okay, we take good note yeah. of this piece of advice as president of the European Central Bank, because you know a little I'm, bit I'm of what you're talking about. I'm not that banks go you know, yeah. out of business and that they reduce their capital and then yeah. they stop complying. They have oh, to comply course. with the rules. They have to be sensible. They have to uh, care for the business, of course, because they are part of the solutions that we found in the last couple of years. No question about that. But when interest rates are hiked in the way they are and have to be, then there has to be that discussion. Madam President, you were saying that energy prices would uh, moderate uh, in this winter. The gas prices were high, even though it was a warm and uh, mild winter. Actually, the main um, responsible for that hike in Spain. But we have a question from a lorry driver who is asking what's going to happen with fuels, with petrol. When will the price of uh, fuel go down? Because we've been losing money for a long time now. Do you believe that once the Ukrainian war is over, we will be able to recover? You know, also about the heating invoices, um, electricity bills. Yeah. If you, look, if you look at wholesale prices, whether it's the price of fuel, oil, or the price of gas, it has gone massively down compared with one year ago. That's what I call the base effects. If we compare the price next March with the price of March a year ago, there will be a significant difference. That there is what economists would call a, a, a lag, lagging, a lag time. There's a, a period of time between the wholesale prices, the channel through the retail prices, and the impact on the consumers. We, we are seeing that, uh, and uh, I have no doubt in my mind that both in terms of um, fuel at the tank or, or gas or electricity, we will see prices coming down. Will the war in Ukraine be a relief? It will be a relief for the Ukrainians, first of all. It will be a relief for peace in the world. And, and we hope so. And, uh, and I hope so very, very much. And we do everything we can to participate in that. But will we return to the same sources of supply? I don't think so. I think we are learning a lesson. And we should not forget it. And we should have security of supply, diversity of supply, proximity of supply which I think will, will completely change the map of our sourcing, uh, particularly in terms of energy, but not only in terms of energy. And finally, this is a question at national level. Well, probably you saw it because on the press, it's everywhere. Ferrovial has decided to um, change their professional domicile to the Netherlands and um, there is, it, it, it wasn't very well taken in. The reason they say is that they're looking for um, legal security and better prices, but a better tax uh, regimes. What do you have to say about that? Because in a European zone where supposedly in terms of taxes, there should be harmony. Uh, you know, I don't want to comment on the specific case of a company because I'm not familiar enough with, with that. But I would observe two things. One is, there is a corporate world. There is a private sector, which is organized by the rules that we have in the corporate world. 
shareholders decide. That's one point. Second point is that this whole story convinces me even more that we have to fight for capital market union. What do large companies want at the moment? They want to extend their market share. They want to diversify their market share. They want to have access to deep and liquid capital. This is not the case in Europe. I'm sorry to say. We have a fragmented market. There's a stock market in Madrid. There's a stock market in Paris. There's one in Frankfurt. Do they work well together? Does the corporate world have access to deep and, and liquid finance? No. Do they have to file multiple prospectus when they go public in different places? Yes. Do they have to use different languages? Yes. Do they have different legal framework within which to operate? Yes. Do they have different bankruptcy law within which to operate? Yes. And do they have different tax rules? Yes. I think on all those points, tax, bankruptcy, uh, single filing, point of access, we are making progress, but not fast enough. I dream of this day when we have this consolidated, coordinated, well-synchronized capital market union where companies like Ferrovial or others will say, I'm fine, I'm going to access a deep capital market in Madrid, Paris or Frankfurt, I'm governed by the same set of rules, I have a guaranteed framework within which I can operate. And if I need to get access to the US market, I'll do a dual listing, one in Europe, one in New York, but I don't have to move necessarily because we are much better unionized. We have monetary union, we can have capital market union. So I'll keep the fight. That was very clear. <laughs> yes, yet another fight to begin. So just to uh, wrap up, I'm asking Carlos Rodriguez, our graphologist, an analysis about your signature. He has been studying your signature and um, according to what you write on our bills. Oh dear. He would like to describe what your personality is like. Carlos, go ahead. Well, it's a, a signature that is very easily uh, readable. We can see the confident. Uh, she brings more importance to her surname, so that's uh, her professional side. But in uh, terms of emotions, she has a lot of self-control. She pro prioritizes thinking over feeling, but at the same time, she's easygoing. So she has a self-control, a great uh, power of will, a fighting attitude towards life. And she's uh, bold because intellectually she's a logical person uh, who can chain ideas together uh, with easy decision-making capacity. And she's a, a constant person. In terms of social relationships, she needs contact, but at the same time, she's quite selective. So not everyone can do. She might be a bit um, lacking trust in some situations, but she is always uh, polite, hardworking and kind with others. Well, I think this is enough, right? Do you agree, Christine? Do you feel, uh, do you, does it resonate with what, with what I, you think? I think you're very flattering. So I, I, I will take all that for me. It's good ego food. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for being here with us today. It's the first interview that you give in Spanish uh, TV. Um, we were delayed, delighted to have you here. And we have learned so much with you. We hope to see you here next year. And I hope that your forecast come to come to, to reality. So hopefully in March, inflation Thank so goes much. better. Thank you so Thank much, you. Christine Lagarde. Right, so we're moving on to the Mediador case.